Hello, everyone, and welcome to Insurance 101, Preparing for Open Enrollment. Michelle Rice from NHF and Spencer Dunn from CIBD will run you through the nuts and bolts of choosing insurance that works best for people with bleeding disorders in just a few minutes. But first, I want to take you through a little bit of housekeeping. So our next webinar, Insurance 101, Transitioning from Your Parents' Insurance, will take place on November 16th, also at noon. And that will really focus on uh, both youth and parents who need a little guidance in helping their, their 20-somethings choose insurance uh, and also how they, how they use insurance because that's something that um, a lot of our young people in this population need a lot of help and orientation on. A few items of housekeeping. If you called in, instead of using your computer audio, please mute your phone so we don't hear background noise. We'll answer questions at the end. You can use the chat feature to ask questions throughout. Um, and we'll also unmute everyone at the very end, and you can ask questions through computer audio or your phone at the end of the presentation. We'll also have slides and a recording available on our website at hemophiliaca.org slash programs slash webinars, and that should be up in uh, about two weeks. And with that, I will hand it over to Michelle Rice. Great, and would you mind going to, there we go, to the first slide. My name is Michelle Rice. I am the Senior VP of External Affairs for the National Hemophilia Foundation. And um, I am happy to be joining you today to talk about a very important topic, which is choosing a health plan. Um, first of all, we are coming up on open enrollment period. Uh, typically, open enrollment occurs once a year. For Covered California, that open enrollment period starts November 1st and ends January 31st. Um, for GHPP and CCS, there's not really a standard open enrollment time period. Um, the renewal date is either is typically based on your initial application date. Now, if you receive your insurance through your employer, typically open enrollment is sometime between October and um, December, and you will typically have a, you know, two weeks to four week period to review your options. What's important to know about open enrollment is that once you've chosen a plan, and open enrollment time period ends, you cannot change that coverage option until the next open enrollment date, which is typically one year later. Unless, of course, there is a qualifying event, um, which examples of qualifying events would be death, termination of employment, diverse onset of a terminal illness, um, adoption, those are a few items that would be that would trigger what we call a qualifying event. Um, next slide, please. There's typical questions that should be considered by anyone during open enrollment periods. For example, those questions would be, what are the plan benefits and how much of those benefits going to cost? And what we mean by plan benefits um, is what is the prescript, does it cover prescriptions? What does that prescription coverage look like? What about hospitalization? Um, what, uh, what does it cover? What does it cover inpatient? What does it cover outpatient? Does it cover specialists? Um, how much does it cost? This is something that can be difficult to determine just by looking at your enrollment documents. So we're going to talk a little bit later about how you can go about trying to calculate what your costs are. But it's important to remember what is included in costs. A lot of times we just think of our monthly premium. 
um, which is the amount that if it's through your employer, typically is deducted from your paycheck. Um, or it's, or, and it also includes deductibles, coinsurance, and copayments. Another thing that will impact your cost is if you have out of network coverage. And we'll talk a little bit about um, how you can determine whether or not you have out of network coverage as we get further into this webinar. But it is very important for you to be looking at your plan initially to find out does it say whether or not you have both in network and out of network coverage. And typically, depending on if you're in network or out of network, that will impact the cost share that belongs to you. Next slide. So um, what to look for in a health plan? So if we go to the next slide there, please. So it's important to make an informed decision in choosing your health care plan. And as I just said, you have to look at your cost versus your benefit. You know, a lot of people who do not use their insurance plan very often will look just at their premium costs and they'll say, you know, this is a this is a great plan. It looks like it covers a lot of things and you know the the cost is relatively inexpensive. It's great if a plan covers a lot of things, but if the one service or program you need is not covered, doesn't really matter how much that plan saved you on its premium it's going to cost you on, on the other end if what you need is not covered. So in order to make sure that you're choosing the right plan, you need to review both your prescription drug formulary, that formulary list that you get from your, um, either your employer or from online with Covered California, and provide, and look at your provider network as well. Next slide. Now, some of those questions that I just talked about were questions that are for anyone. If you have a bleeding disorder, there are some additional questions that you should be asking. One is, of course, is my factor covered? But almost as important as if your factor is covered is understanding which benefit it's covered under. And what I mean by that is it covered as a major medical expense or is it covered um, under your pharmacy benefit as a pharmacy expense? The reasons why that matters um, is one, related to cost, two, is typically related to where you can get your product, um, who your provider can be, and um, also three, typically under the medical benefit, there are less restrictions as to which product you can use as compared to the prescription benefit where there may be a preferred drug list. The other thing with a bleeding disorder you need to ask is, do I have a choice of more than one pharmacy provider? If it's under your pharmacy benefit, you want to make sure that you have more than one option in the event that the pharmacies that are in the network are not familiar with hemophilia. We, we have run into those situations where the pharmacies that are in the pharmacy network, that while they may be specialty pharmacies, they may be specialty pharmacies that have never worked with bleeding disorders before. The next question is, is your HTC in network? And what we mean by that is, is your hemophilia treatment provider or your hemophilia treatment center in network? Are they in network for medical services? And if you choose to get your clotting factor from them, are they in network? for the factor provision as well, whether that's under pharmacy or under major medical, are they an authorized provider? Another important thing for us to think about is, do I need a referral to see a specialist? Um, a lot of that depends on the type of plan you choose. Oftentimes, if you have a HMO or a health maintenance organization, those will require you to get a referral to see your HTC specialist. 
Again, why does that matter? It impacts the cost to you as a, as a um, covered person. The next question is what services require prior authorization? In the past, clotting factor typically at the beginning of the year, you could get a prior authorization to receive your clotting factor once a year. It would require your doctor calling in, verifying that you have the diagnosis of a clot of a bleeding disorder, and and you could get a year's prior off for your medication. That is changing rapidly. Some health plans require it every six months. Some require it every three months. I have even heard of a few that require it monthly. So it's important to know that, again, because it impacts your cost. With prior authorizations and referrals, if those are required and you don't get them and you receive the service or receive the product, there is the potential for you to be charged for that full amount rather than what your coverage states under your policy because technically you will not have filed, uh, filed, followed the rules. And then the last question is, is durable medical equipment covered? There are still instances where you may need to use crutches or a wheelchair, or you may need orthotics in your shoes, or you may need a brace. It's good to find out if durable medical equipment is covered because often it may have its own deductible or it may have a limitation on how much um, can be spent for durable medical equipment in a given time period. Next slide. So getting started, one of the things that I will say, I, something I did not disclose at the beginning of this uh, webinar is that I have two children with severe hemophilia. So I am painfully aware of how difficult the process of choosing your coverage can be and making sure you think of everything beforehand. Um, what I will tell you, one of the most effective ways to figure out what the cost will be to you of any health plan is to begin by charting your family's personal health experience. And what I mean by that is looking at the past 12 months this previous year, how many times did you access certain services? And I'll go into that a little bit again um, as, as we move through the webinar. The second important thing is to know the meaning of the terms in your policy. Much like government, insurance uses a lot of acronyms. It's important to understand what those are so that you understand what that means to you. Uh, a good example of that is you'll hear that there's a EPO plan or an HMO plan or a POS plan, it's important to understand what those, what the differences are between those. Then I would say to make sure that you have the following documents out and available for you to review as you're making your decisions um, and have this for each plan. Most, if you're going through an employer group or if you're going through the marketplace, um, which is covered California, you'll see that there are multiple plans to choose from. So it's important to make sure you're looking at, for each one of those plans, the benefit summary, the drug formulary list, or your prescription drug formulary or, or preferred drug list, and your provider network booklet. Next slide, please. So what you see here on your screen is a copy of a, of a personal health experience stat sheet. This is a document that was created by NHF and is part of our personal health insurance toolkit. This is a bound um, workbook that we have at NHF, or you can actually go and, and download this um, from our website. But basically, this goes back to what I said about charting your, your family's health experience. What you'll see some sample questions. These que questions are all related to different sorts of services that are covered under insurance, but that typically have some sort of cost share with them. So for example, in the past 12 months, I have visited my primary care physician X number of times. 
most of us know if the last 12 months of a, you know, of our medical care is standard for us or not. So for example, if I say, you know what, I went to the doctor twice this year, and that's usually pretty normal for me. Or you can say, boy, I was, went to the doctor 10 times this year. That's not really, that's an abnormal year for me. A normal year may be five times a year. But this is, this is what you want to track here. And the other thing is, what I have found is that many of us who are affected by bleeding disorders are very well aware of our costs related to the bleeding disorder. And we think about these questions when it comes to clotting factor or our HTC visits. But many of us are under family health plans. So it's important to think about every person in your family as you're thinking about what your potential costs will be. So for example, first I say, you know, how many times have I visited my primary care physician? How many times has my spouse visited the primary care physician? How many times have my children visited their primary care physician? Um, how many times have we been seen by a specialist? Um, visited an ER? Another big one is purchasing prescriptions. Again, most of us are very familiar with what it costs us for our clotting factor copay, whether that's you know so much a month or whether that's what our deductible or out of pocket is. But it's important to remember there are other people in the family who may have other um, healthcare needs. And for example, I re, um, again, I will relate a personal story. My husband and I both use, you know, have asthma. So we use inhalers, we use, and you don't think about, you tend to not think about those things that you go and pick up at your pharmacy that are $30 a month. But I can tell you those start to add up. And they also count now towards your maximum out of pocket. So it's important to, to plan for those. So again, these are just some questions that we ask you to go through and sit down and, and write out. What you don't see on this sheet is there's a second page to this, and, and what the second page says is it provides you a space to list all of your clinicians that you visit, you know, whether that's your HTC doc, your primary care physician, who is your, if you have an allergist, if you have some other specialist you see, an orthopedist. What is the emergency room that you go to most often if you have an emergency? If you're someone who lives close to an urgy care center and that's a place that you go for, for emergencies, write those all down because it's going to be important when you go to look through your provider network that you're not just looking for your HTC, but are all of the facilities that I use in my network as well. Because again, this will impact your cost. Next slide, please. And again, when we start talking about healthcare terms, um, also in the health insurance toolkit on the NHF website, which I believe will also become available on the um, council's website as well, is a glossary of healthcare terms. And not only insurance terms um, utilized by insurance providers, but also um, terms you will hear when people are talking about health reform. So for example, they will, you'll find a definition for the difference between an HMO, a health maintenance organization, or a PPO, which is a preferred provider organization. Again, why that matters, for example, a preferred provider organization is one that might provide you with the opportunity to see a broad spectrum of physicians. They'll have a very broad network, um, and they will typically have in-network and out-of-network benefits. So you can choose to see someone out-of-network. You may just have a little bit higher out-of-pocket costs for that versus an HMO or a health maintenance organization, which may be lower in premium even lower in your cost share when you go to your physician, your physician visit may be $10 versus $20 under a PPO. But the difference is that typically most HMOs do not offer out-of-network benefits. 
it's important for you to think about your lifestyle when you're choosing a health plan as well. So for example, I may look at an HMO plan and I may see that all of my doctors that I regularly see are in network. And I may think this is great because it also offers a lower um, premium and so I'll think about taking that plan. However, if I'm someone who travels a lot for work and I or someone else in my family travels a lot for work and tends to be out of state, I may want to rethink whether or not I get an HMO plan because if you are out of state and you don't have out of network benefits, as is the case with a lot of HMOs, then what that means is if you have to access a service in another state that's outside of network, you will be responsible for that full cost unless it is determined to be an emergency. And I will give you an example. Um, when you or I may think of something as an emergency, we may have a horrible earache. We may have, it's, you know, difficult to sleep. It's difficult to, you know, get on the plane. So we'll go to an urgy care center. The insurance company may not determine that to be an emergency. They may figure you could have waited until you got home. Typically, when you look at a lot of these health plans and you look at their definition of urgent, it is loss of life or limb. For most of us, a little gray area there in between where we might consider um, something else an emergency. So in that case, if I'm someone who travels a lot or have someone else who's insured on that plan that travels a lot, I may want to really look at, should I be getting a PPO instead that, has, that offers me some out-of-network benefits? So um, next slide, please. So before I turn this over to Spencer, um, I want to say that that was a very quick summary of what you need to know for open enrollment. But one of the things that I, I cannot stress enough is that the, it is really important to spend a reasonable amount of time in going through your benefits. There was a study done once that said the average person spends about an hour going through their benefits at work and that includes their insurance, if they have an FSA, if they have a retirement fund, if they have life insurance. If they have, I would argue that you should be spending at least an hour going through your health insurance benefits. And I can tell you it is really important to read not only the summary of benefits, but most employers will also give you a link to the plan or there's more detailed information, like I said, a link to the drug formulary list and a link to your provider network booklet. And it is, I cannot stress enough, again, how important it is to go and look and see if your providers are in network. And if they're not, understand whether or not you have an out of network benefit so that you can plan for what that cost is going to be. Because again, once you get into a plan, you are in it for a year, unless you have a qualifying um, uh, event, which as we saw at the beginning, I don't think we, any of us wanna have any of those as a reason to change our health plan. So I, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Spencer, who's gonna share some information with you on programs specific to California that can be used together with um, your traditional healthcare coverage. Thanks, Michelle. Um, my name is Spencer Dunn. I'm a social worker um, at a hemophilia treatment center in um, Orange, California. So in the Orange County, Southern California area. Um, and I was gonna talk kind of, just give really loose overviews um, about CCS and GHVP. These are two um, programs um, that I think some may be familiar with and some not. So um, CCS was a program um, started in 1927, um, and it's the Crippled Children's Service Program. Um, and so essentially this is the, um, provides um, coverage for 
individuals who have a chronic health condition, hemophilia being one of them. Um, and it covers you from age of diagnosis um, till the age of 21. Um, this is funded with state, county, and federal tax monies, um, along with some fees by um, the parents. So like I stated, this program is um, open to individuals under 21 years old, and they have to have a medical condition that is covered by CCS, hemophilia being one of those. It has to be a resident of California. This is specific to um, California residents. Um, they have the family income has to be less than forty thousand um, annual gross income, um, or whose out of pocket medical expenses are expected to be more than twenty percent of the family's income. Um, so this is kind of what we call the the pediatric or the, or the kids um, kind of coverage. If there's no um, family coverage in place, usually how you see this getting started, how I've seen it. Um, is usually the paperwork will get started either by a physician um, who is making the diagnosis of hemophilia. So um, usually that is the hemo pediatric hematologist um, and they will start this paperwork along with the family if there's no insurance in place. Um, so that's usually how CCS is kind of introduced. Um, the next one I kind of wanted to go into is genetically handicapped persons program. Um, and this is often the term you will hear is GHPP. Um, and this is for individuals who are 21 and older, um, and you need a diagnosis that qualifies you. Um, hemophilia is one of them. Um, and there may be enrollment fees um, with GHPP, and you have to um, enroll and then keep up enroll, uh, enrollment every year. Um, otherwise, you will be excluded if you don't keep up with that. Um, GHVP applications are found online. I think some of the easiest thing to do is just Google GHPP and you can see the application um, online. Um, and there is some personal information that have to be disclosed. There's health insurance information. So one thing about GHVP is um, you can have it as a secondary. Um, insurance, if you do hold um, an insurance maybe from an employer or um, Covered California, but keep in mind there may be fees associated with it. Um, and you also do need a um, provider to state, uh, a physician to state that you do have a diagnosis that qualifies you for this. Um, there are some components of income verification. Um, there is an enrollment fee. Um, you do need a photo ID and proof of California residency. Um, again, some of the main things that I see um, maybe delaying the approval of GHPP, the most common one I actually see in my treatment center is um, the income verification. And this can be tax forms that you send in to GHPP or um, a verification of a California residency. Um, they need some proof that you do live within the state of California. I've heard of patients using um, a utility bill that is in their name and has their address on it to show that they are um, eligible or they are California residents. Um, so this kind of gives a breakdown of, of the fees associated with GHPP. Um, like I said, it is um, kind of income dependent on a sliding scale of how much the fee will be. Here we give an example of family members. You have a house of four um, individuals. Um, the federal poverty, poverty level for this would be tw around $22,000. Um, your family adjusted gross income for you guys is 50,000. So kind of you can see the equation a little bit that the fee equals the percentage of the difference of the annual gross income. So the enrollment fee for this would be about $750. Um, just so you can kind of see that they, there is different fees associated. It's not a set fee. Um, it is kind of dependent on income members of the family. Um, so 
things to consider. This is, I think, a really important one that um, GHPP, YCCS does a really good job of, of making sure that we get the other specialists. GHPP really only takes care of hemophilia um, and von Willebrand's disease. It, um, say if you're driving in a and or you're goofing around with some friends and you slip and fall and break your arm. Um, GHPP is not going to cover the broken arm because it's not related to the hemophilia. So you really have to understand that GHPP will take care of um, the hemophilia aspects of your health, not um, primary care. I often have patients who um, were somewhat unaware of this and they'll say, I called, you know, a primary care physician and they've never heard of this um, insurance. So you have to be aware of that. Um, it's not a widely known um, insurance outside of hemophilia. Um, the biggest thing is to start researching before you turn 21 um, to look at your options um, if you're aging out and kind of going back to what Michelle says, see what's out there. Is covered California plan going to be okay for you? Will that um, be good? Are you going to have an employer plan and do you have GHPP as a secondary? Um, there's a lot of kind of things to consider. And so you don't want to just turn 21 and, and have to hit the panic mode. Um, and this kind of is hitting back to what Michelle was talking about. Do you require other subspecialists? Um, like you have asthma, GHPP won't cover that because it's not related to um, your hemophilia so that you might have to do um, pay out of pocket if you're going to go see this, if you just consider just to have GHBP. Um, and what does your, if you're transitioning in adulthood, sometimes we see the transition age around 21, does the adult provider take GHBP? I, I tend to think most HTCs are aware of GHBP, um, but I don't want to speak for everyone. Um, um, also a great resource if you're just feeling stuck, and I really encourage everyone to do this, is there, there's a couple of, of places you can reach out. The Hemophilia um, Council of California is one. If they don't have the answer, they usually can help you track down someone in your area that might help you navigate this um, this kind of insurance adventure. <laughs> um, your local chapters are a good one. I know there's a northern, uh, a southern California chapter and a San Diego chapter. Um, and I, your local hemophilia treatment centers um, the social workers usually at your treatment centers are well versed and can sit down. Um, oftentimes, I will sit down with some patients if they're overwhelmed and just explain terminology. Social workers or no one should really tell you what plan. You have to make that decision what plan is right for you. Um, no one can kind of dictate that. But just to kind of go over what the terminology means so that you have a better understanding of your coverage. Um, so I think those are kind of the overviews and things to consider um, when considering insurance. Um, I think right now, I think insurance is one of those things that's um, kind of we, we have problems on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. So I think opening it up for questions, if there is any, would be wonderful. Um, and maybe we can either give you resources or, or answer it for you. And Spencer, can you uh, advance to the next slide? Sorry. Oh, there you go. Perfect. And now one question while I unmute everyone uh, for questions is, uh, is my understanding correct that with GHPP, there's an expectation that you either um, have other insurance or that you have been um, either refused other coverage or can't or are able to document that you can't uh, find affordable coverage? That's a great point, Robin. That's exactly correct. Um, you, sh you should try to, to find um, insurance, whether that's on Covered California or explore your employer's health um, insurance that's available to you. And if you if you can't find anything else, um, GHPP is that safety kind of net for you. Great. Right. Well, everyone is off mute. So, uh, does anyone have questions about what to uh, 
what to look for, you can use the group chat to ask questions, or you can um, also just ask your questions with your computer audio or your phone. questions on um, Covered California, G -G GHPP, CCS, or even just if you need a little more in-depth information um, from what Michelle was covering about how to choose um, and issues to look at. Um, and in particular, uh, one question I have for you, Michelle, actually, is when you're checking for a form what's on the formulary um, and to check and see if you're uh, your particular clotting factor is is the your insurance the formulary of the insurance that you're looking at. Um, how would you go about checking that? That is a good question, and I'm glad you asked that. And I, I usually bring that up, so thank you. Um, figuring out how your factor is covered is still probably the single hardest thing to figure out on your health insurance plan. Oftentimes, um, you know, factor, first of all, used to be covered under major medical the majority of the time. Now it's about 60% of health plans cover it under pharmacy and about 40% cover it under major medical. So um, sometimes if you look at the preferred drug list, you may not find clotting factor. So you could... Assume then that it may be covered under major medical, or it's important to call your insurance company and say, how is clotting factor covered? And this is the important part, for outpatient use. The reason why I think it's important for you to say for outpatient use is a lot of times clotting factor is covered under both benefits. It will be covered under major medical for when you're inpatient, or for if you need assistance in giving yourself factor. So if you're having a nurse come out to your house, it may be covered under major medical, but if you are self-infusing, a lot of times it's covered under pharmacy. That's a distinction that some of the insurance providers make. The reason why it's important for you to know which one, again, is because it may affect your cost, but it also may affect where you can get your factor. Sometimes if it's covered under major medical, you may have a broader um, network of providers you can get your factor from, um, but under the pharmacy benefit, they may have a designated specialty pharmacy or specialty pharmacies that are authorized to provide. But one of the things to ask as well is, if you don't see it on your drug formulary list, is to ask, do you have a specialty drug list? Um, sometimes they have those drugs separate from their, from their main preferred drug list, and that's not always posted. So it's important to say, how is clotting factor covered outside or for, for, for um, outpatient use? And who are the providers that I can obtain that from? I always suggest doing this twice. Whenever you call to ask this question, first of all, ask the name of the person you're speaking to, document that somewhere that you aren't going to lose it, write down who you talk to and what day, and even what time. Ask that question, get an answer. The thing you can ask them is, can you point me to my po where in my policy it tells me that, so that, so that you can have that for reference. If they say, well, it's not written in the policy, it's here, ask them if they can send you a letter um, that states that that's how it's covered. Sometimes they will do that, sometimes they won't, but it's always good to ask because it gives you something to refer to if it ever gets questioned um, in the future. Then what I do is I typically hang up, I wait about an hour, I call back because you will get somebody else, ask the question the same way, again, ask who it is, who you've spoken to, you, what you want to see is if you're going to get the same answer. I will tell you this, if you don't get the same answer, then you call back a third time and that's when you ask for the supervisor and you let them know that you're calling to confirm your benefits 
that this is what you've been told. Tell them who you called, who you talked to, what time, what you were told. Ask them you would like it confirmed. And again, ask it for it in a letter of confirmation. If you are still having difficulties figuring out how your factor is covered after you've tried those things, you can reach out to your social worker who can try to help you. Um, oftentimes your um, pharmacy supplier or whoever you're getting your cl clotting factor from can make a call to that provider too. They can run a test claim and see how that comes back. Um, or you can reach out to my team at um, the National Hemophilia Foundation. You can ask for someone on the policy team, and we can try to help you get that information. Thank you, Michelle. And um, a couple of questions have come in via chat. Uh, related to that, uh, we have a question. Will there ever be a standardized method for factor in terms of medical versus prescription, in your opinion? Or I would say no. <laughs> I would say no. And part of that is because you have lots of different types of plans, too. You have um, ones where it is uh, where they're self-insured, where your employer is actually really paying for the cost um, versus a fully insured plan where the employer is paying an insurance company to, to take the risk and to process all the claims. Um, I think that over time, I, I think also as we're coming out with new different types of therapies, those therapies may end up being covered differently too. Whereas you may have one policy that says, yep, all, all clotting factor is covered under um, pharmacy. And then you will find out that some of these new therapies that are not really clotting factors um, may end up being covered under major medical. So it really does differ. Um, you even have some plans, just to make it even more confusing, you even have some plans who give you the option. You can do it under under pharmacy or under major medical. And the difference is typically under major medical, you may have all of your costs out of pocket up front. And under pharmacy, you may have a $50 copay each month. So it's kind of, you know, do you pay it all up front or do you pay it monthly? So unfortunately, I don't think it will be standardized. It would be lovely, but it probably won't be. Thank you. Now, one other question is for people who have employer-based insurance, <clears throat> and so they're looking through their, their employer's options, are there any particular questions that you would re recommend people ask HR, um, or is it just something that they would be dealing directly with whoever their, the insurance contact is? I would strongly encourage them to speak directly to the insurer, I think if, or to the plan, I think if there is a point where there needs to be clarification, then I think, or if you're not getting an answer, then I think that's when you go to your HR. Um, you know, there, there are laws that protect you from, you know, being dismissed from, you know, your job due to your health status. But I also know that some people are nervous about sharing health status. Um, I think there are ways you can ask those questions generally. Um, and again, we can help guide you when, when that comes up, if, if you want to do that or if you're nervous about speaking to your employer. I think um, you'll find that, you know, some people do, you know, your employer may know you have hemophilia. Um, and but I can tell you that, that not all HR folks, um, they may have an understanding of how insurance is supposed to work. That doesn't necessarily mean that they know specifically about that one plan. So I think it's, it's, a, um, it, it, it's a case of I always like to get it confirmed from the insurance company first, but if you're having difficulty getting it from the health plan, then I would suggest you go to your HR department to ask them if they can help you. 
because they will typically have a broker they're working with and the broker is usually able to get to that information. Great. And uh, Spencer, for you, a question came in about um, how soon someone can start the application process to transition from CCS to GHPP. Oh, Spencer, you might be, you might have muted yourself. Can you hear me now? I apologize. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I usually CCS was said in paperwork out saying that you are aging and that's kind of the appropriate time to initiate that with paperwork. Um, but I think speaking to a, a, a kind of a larger concept of um, at 21, there should be the, I mean, you should start looking at what is the best option for me um, and do I have other options? Um, it shouldn't necessarily just be go to GHPP, but do I qualify for a plan on Covered California that um, would give me preventative health like primary care and all the other treatment I need? Um, and or it, do I have a job that will will give me insurance? And then maybe I just have GHPP as a secondary. Um, and so I, I think at 21, when I say start planning, start looking at other plans too ahead of time that, that may um, give you a greater scope of wellness. And, <clears throat> uh, and also so people are aware, um, GHPP, uh, the office that and the staff that handles uh, GHPP authorizations and both application renewals and new applications recently moved from uh, an office in Sacramento to an office in Los Angeles, Los Angeles. and and with the new um, uh, with all the new staff and the transition there is currently a backlog with both um, authorizations and with application renewals and processing new applications for GHPP so someone had asked if there are specific contacts um, at GHPP, and uh, there are, and I'll send up, we can send out a follow-up email to participants that just has that as a reference for, for CCS, um, sorry, not for CCS, for GHPP. Uh, this is the person who's handling authorizations. This is the person who is handling renewals. Uh, so that if you wind up in a tight spot, those are the people you can contact um, if you are running if you have GHPP currently and your authors or your um, either an authorization hasn't gone through and you're about to run out of medication or if you, your renewal or your new application for coverage was sent in a long time ago and you're about your coverage is about to lapse uh, you can also contact uh, me at uh, the hemophilia council and we will um, see if we can uh, con connect with the leadership there as well to make sure that you don't fall off and fall out of the system. All right, we have a few more minutes. Are there any more questions that anyone has? I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, this is Michelle, I have my hand raised. I don't know if that, <laughs> you can see it. <laughs> um, this is a question for Spencer. Um, this is Michelle, hi, from the Hemophilia Foundation. We get a lot of, well, not a lot, but we get quite a number of calls from people either moving from out of the country to California or out of state, and they want to apply for GHPP. Um, we find it difficult with people who are moving from out of the country. We tell them to provide documentation of their diagnosis, but a lot of times that's in a different language. And some of them also don't have that documentation. So obviously they need to see the hematologist, but then they don't have their insurance. They don't have the GHPP yet. So how is that handled? Because I know like 
when we first started, we had no idea. So we were like offering to pay cash <laughs> visits for people. Okay. That wasn't quite the right way to go, but we were just kind of confused about, about what to tell people. Oh, yeah, that, that is a tricky one. Um, and I think you're going to get different um, kind of responses from the treatment centers, at least, um, across the state. Um, I think each center might handle that differently. Um, also, the one thing, too, to kind of that they need is also proof of California residency. So it's, it's a little bit of a tricky one to do proactively. Um, uh -huh. So... You get what I'm saying? Um, but I know um, I can speak kind of for our center that we will see the, the patient. And, um, and this is at the Center for Inherited Blood Disorders that we do, so I don't want to speak for other treatment centers. But we will see the patient um, knowing that they don't have their insurance in place yet um, and then work with them to make sure that they get it in place moving forward. Um, and so I think different treatment centers are going to handle the situation a little bit differently. Mm. Um, so, um, okay. that one is kind of a, a, a big policy question. Okay. And, and for that proof of residency, um, one of the, as I understand it, one of the more common forms of proof of residency is a utility bill in your name. Um, it can also be tax returns or there are lots of other forms listed on the GHPP website. Uh, but they do need do need something in their name that establishes that residency before they can apply. Right. That has never been an issue with any of the folks. Somehow that's <laughs> they're able to get that. Yeah. But. Yeah. And okay. Yeah, I I think maybe it's something that I, I think as a as a region, we can kind of tackle that problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I think some people do have different problem. standards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have another question that um, probably both uh, Spencer and Michelle can help with. Um, someone asked, I would like to know what are the key words that a patient or applicant should use when they are shopping for the best insurance plans? Many insurance reps don't even know what factor is and how or even if it's covered. Well, I can tell you, um, you're absolutely right, and, and to be honest, even some people on the phone, when you call into an insurance company directly, are not going to know. I'll give you a good example that happens a lot on the marketplace, so probably would also be something that you do see in covered California, is because some of those health plans do cover factor as a major medical benefit or, as I said, on a specialty preferred drug list. Typically what, what those people who are on customer service when you call in and you ask if clotting factor is covered, they're just going to look at their standard preferred drug list and they're probably going to look for clotting factor. The problem is sometimes it's under anti-hemophilic clotting factor, sometimes it's under blood modifiers, sometimes it's under, so it's under a lot of different things. So what I would say to you is when you call and say, I'm asking if clotting factor such as, give them the name of your factor, give them the name of another factor as well. So that if your factor, because it may just be, for example, your product is not a preferred product, right? So you would want to give them a couple of factor names for them to look at. Um, and that helps them get to where they need to be um, to find that information. Again, when someone says to you, no factor is not covered on this under this program, because again, that's what we would get from a lot of people on the marketplace. In most instances, what that meant was it was probably covered under major medical. But even though I would say that to the person, they would say, no. Nope. And that's because they, they hear the medication we take is, and they think of that as a prescription. They think of medication as prescription. So it's harder for them to get to what is covered, what prescriptions are covered under med medical um, coverage. I will tell you this, 
it is really illegal at this point for any health plan to not cover any of the clotting factor therapies. They have to cover at least one or two in each drug class. So anyone who says we don't cover that at all is probably mistaken. That is a good sign to go to their supervisor or to ask for a manager in benefits. And if you still get that answer, then I would suggest you reach out either A, to the social worker at your center, or you reach out to us at NHF and, and we can make a call. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many times people were told that on the marketplace, and we would end up calling somebody that we know and who's in a uh, position of power at one of those places, and they would say, well, of course we have to cover factor. It's, it's the law. So they don't have to cover all products, but they do have to cover, I mean, they can't say to you, we don't cover any. That would be the very rare extreme kind of exception policy. So if they're telling you no, and you've given them a couple of names of the product, if you've asked them to look under major medical as well, or ask them for a specialty drug list, then I would say ask for a supervisor. If that person still doesn't give you an answer, then you can contact us and we can try to help get that information for you. And Michelle, are there any other um, key things that someone should, should look at or ask related to other care? Um, like if, uh, in terms of things like if you know that you may need um, a joint fusion or joint replacement in the near future or um, other kinds of, of care that people should flag when they're talking with their insurance companies outside of factor? Well, again, I think the key is one thing to remember is provider networks can change all the time. Mm -hmm. um, your preferred drug list, they may be able to to drop something off of coverage, but they would have to notify you. Um, they typically cannot change it to a higher cost share without notifying you. Um, but I would say, you know, if you are seeing an orthopedist now, again, when I'm enrolling, I would look to see if that orthopedist is in network. I would look to see if their facility is in network. The other big one is if, if you're somebody who gets regularly labs, your labs drawn, check and see if the lab you are using is covered under your insurance plan. That's probably one of the biggest places in Spencer. I don't know if you see that right now, but that's typically one of the things that, you know, you'll go to the lab at your treatment center or you'll go to your lab at the hospital where your treatment center is only to find out that that lab is not in network um, and that can cause you some problems but so I, that's why I encourage you to write down every type of service that you get now write down who it is that provides those so that you can go through that provider network and look at it the other thing is let's say you know you're going to have a surgery and you know you're going to need PT afterwards that's something you may want to ask what what is what is available um, what is the benefit related to physical therapy? Because sometimes that is still one of the things that can be limited to the number of appointments you have in a year. So for example, I can say you could have 20 PT appointments in a year. And if you know that you're gonna have to have surgery or you're somebody that is, is currently having PT, you're gonna wanna ask that question. Yeah, I think this is kind of that perfect example of the list Michelle was going over. Um, and it even says if I'm going to have this, if I know I'm going to need, uh, you know, a joint replacement or joint fusion, um, what medical equipment do I need then? And is that covered? So this kind of example is the prime example of things to really sit down and list, um, you know, and, and usually, you know, I, I, I need PT relatively six times a year. This is these are things that you all need, you need to look down or write down and sit down when you're looking things over for open enrollment. And there's one more question for GHPP. We've just got time for this last question. 
which is if you are turning 21 and you already know that you want to enroll in GHPP, do you have to wait until you're 21 to apply or can you begin that application process before your 21st birthday? Yeah, I, I don't know if there's an exact timeline. I know what I see at, my, at, at our center is, you know, usually patients start around six months before 21 um, to give themselves a buffer. I don't know if GHPP has a, an exact time um, but I have seen about six months prior, they'll start filling everything out and getting everything in so that there's no lapse in coverage. Um, and that's just what I see it at kind of my center at CABD. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you so much, Michelle and Spencer, for sharing your expertise and um, giving all this wonderful information and answering questions. I hope everyone learned a little bit to help them planning for their insurance um, and choosing that. I'm about to go through the open enrollment experience myself, so uh, this was certainly helpful for me. <laughs> so I hope everyone got <laughs> a bit out of this. Thank you very much. Thank again. you. And Thank you. Thank you. Again, just wanted to remind everyone that um, our webinar on transitioning from your parents' insurance, so covering nuts and bolts of both how do you choose, how do you get insurance and how do you use insurance and what are all those terms and what do they mean uh, will take place on November 16th. Uh, so spread the word and I hope you can join us. Great, thank you. All thank right, you. Bye.